When a 66-year-old woman gave birth in Romania earlier this year, it was just the latest IVF controversy. By the time her daughter hits her teens, Adriana will be 79 years old. Assisted reproductive technologies are always going to be at the forefront of change. The extremes of IVF always hit the headlines. But for some people, a designer baby means the difference between life and death. To spend every day watching him, not knowing what was going to happen to him and how long we had left with him. And those who can't get what they want at home pick up their passports. Oh. Instead of going to art galleries, we came to a clinic. And hopefully we'll come back pregnant. <laughs> In the story of IVF, there's always a new avenue for those desperate for a precious baby. IVF has helped thousands of couples conceive. Some people need IVF even when they have no difficulty getting pregnant, so that life-threatening conditions can be spotted before the pregnancy even takes place. Oh, you put the first thing. Yeah. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, PGD for short, can now screen embryos for certain genetic conditions before they are even placed in the womb. But it has raised concerns about creating so-called designer babies. We wouldn't be going through PGD had we not lost Bradley, had we have not had a medical termination, and had we not had a miscarriage. It's not to just get a perfect child. Steve and Lucy Ryle Thurlow have no problems getting pregnant, but any child they do conceive has a one in four chance of having a fatal condition. They first met in the hotel where Lucy was head receptionist and Steve was a porter. Steve made Lucy breakfast because he thought she was too skinny and a romance began. They married in 2000 and live near Blackpool. The couple had no idea they had a genetic problem. Then their first child, Bradley, was born in 1998. First of all, it was his hands and his feet, which didn't work. And the neck muscles, they never worked. Then his feeding and swallowing mechanisms went. And then his, his breathing was gradually, over time, becoming very, very laboured. And his chest caved in. It was, oh, it was horrendous to see him. And everything was slowly and surely packing up. It just went worse and worse and worse. Bradley had type 1 spinal muscular atrophy, a condition in which the muscles gradually waste away. The couple were told he would not reach his first birthday. It was just devastating, really. To be told your child's going to die is just the worst thing ever. He had to wake up every morning, run to his cot to see if he was still breathing. There wasn't anything worse, and we just couldn't believe it. As Bradley deteriorated, Lucy became pregnant again. The unborn baby was tested for SMA and proved to have the killer disease. The couple had to make a life or death decision. I just can't believe I signed a piece of paper to say that I would kill my own child. To me, that's how I've got it in my head. And no matter what I tell myself and what people tell me, I I'll never forgive myself for doing it. If we hadn't have terminated... We could have died in a week old anyway. Could have died 
as soon as it was born. He would have died. Without a doubt. If he was not the, so much, he would have died, but... The only outcome of this condition is death. Two months later, at just 16 months old, Bradley died. Six months after that, Lucy was pregnant again, and this time Tess showed the baby would be healthy. Penny was born in 2001. Penny's just turned three, and she's very far from shy. She's a very outgoing little girl. She's very special. It's Have just come out of an egg. The following year, Lucy fell pregnant a fourth time. Tess revealed that baby too was free of SMA, but then disaster struck. Sadly, I contracted an infection through having had the test done, which led me into uh, premature labour. And sadly, she was. Uh, she, she didn't survive, so uh, that was just the most horrendous one, to lose a healthy child through a test which is done to make sure the baby's healthy. You just can't explain that one. Is that good? Do you like that, Penny? Now, Lucy and Steve have turned to pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to make sure the embryo is healthy before the pregnancy even begins. Hold on with one hand. Hold on with that hand, just hold with this hand. Going through the route of PGD will ensure us with the best possibility ever. We have a child that doesn't have spinal muscular atrophy. And to us, it's our last option. People believe that PGD is somehow a slippery slope which will allow couples to select babies with blue eyes or blonde hair. Actually, that's nonsense. The so-called designer baby in our medical context is for the practice of good medicine for sick families. It's trying to spare couples the heartbreak of having children who they have to watch dying. Lucy's taking drugs to stimulate egg production. <laughs> the first time I did it was horrible. I was shaking like a leaf. But once I'd done it, I was fine. You don't feel it. You just feel the, the actual drug going in and it's just tender. That's all. <laughs> It'll be worth it. It's a chance. It's a lot of money and a lot of time for it to uh, fail. That's why that's why. It's make or break for Lucy, who has NHS funding for only one go at IVF. She's got to hope she can beat the odds and get pregnant first time round. <laughs> In Britain, IVF practice is strictly regulated by the Human Fertility and Embryology Authority. But it's not the same everywhere. Just across Europe, let alone the world, there are different regulations in each state about what is allowed in their own country. As the 66-year-old Romanian mother shows, what's unacceptable in one country can be fine just across the border. So some British couples are becoming IVF tourists exploiting the loopholes. Juliet and Stan Stamper long for a baby, but Juliet needs an egg donor, and they're being forced abroad to find one. I suppose, in a way, yes, we are pioneering that. 
Does not really feel like it? But... <laughs> Feels like we're going on holiday. Yeah, that's what we're, we're trying. We're trying to say we're going on holiday. Instead of going to art galleries, we're going to a clinic. And hopefully, we'll come back pregnant. <laughs> Juliet had just decided she'd had enough of men when she and Stan met in a pub. He walked her home and won her heart by singing the Rolf Harris hit, Two Little Boys. They share a passion for sport and married on cup final day in 2000. Juliet has spent the four years since then trying to get pregnant. In my work, there's people around me all the time who are pregnant, who've just had a baby. It's, it's a constant, constant reminder. Some people do it as a you know, drop of a hat and they're pregnant. It's easy. For, <laughs> it's a struggle for us. So, so children that we have are going to be special. All children are special, but they're going to be precious. Juliet had one failed cycle of IVF before a second cycle brought bad news. I was told that actually this test indicated I had a less than 5% chance of, of any IVF cycle working, which it, it was a bit like being whacked over the head with a baseball bat, really. So basically, in fertility terms, I'm not producing eggs, so I need somebody else's eggs. But after a year on the waiting list for eggs, the Stampers' hopes of getting pregnant seem further off than ever. The supply of altruistic donors or even known donors who are prepared to offer eggs to help childless women become pregnant is very small and in most clinics now the waiting list is a year or even two years. The critical shortage of donors is driving the stampers to Spain where there's no waiting list and they will simply pay 700 pounds to an anonymous donor. British law doesn't allow donors to be paid for eggs. We don't want eggs or sperm to become a commodity. Um, we don't wish women to feel that they need to provide eggs in order to be able, for argument's sake, to feed existing children at home. For Juliet, things were going well until she realised that the Spanish doctor expected her to buy the IVF drugs over the counter, because that's what you do in Spain. And that was a bit of a panic, wasn't it? Because mm. the chemists, we found out, would not give us the medication without a prescription. Um, so I contacted my doctor. Um, he, he thought about it. He had a meeting with the, the other doctors in the practice. They considered it, which was nice of them, but. They, were, they decided in the end they weren't going to have clinical control over my treatment, so they didn't want to prescribe me the, the medication. I finally managed to get um, Dr Benito in Spain to go and buy the medication himself, and he posted them to me. It then became a bit DIY, I suppose, DIY donor treatment, I, I've been calling it. You know, I've had one phone call conversation with him, but every contact we've had with the clinic has been through email. I'm kind of here on my own with Stan. <laughs> I was going to say on my own completely. <laughs> but it, it, we're doing it on our own. It's, it, it is very, very odd. There are risks going abroad. There's also the traumas. There are the traumas of having countries with a language people do not understand. Enormous additional added expense, not just financial expense, which is true, emotional expense as well. So I've got croissants for breakfast when your mum and dad come. Juliet is now completely outside the medical system in Britain and feeling uncertain. As the trip to Spain gets nearer, her doubts surface as her video diary reveals. Um, actually, I will have a drink after. There's just something reassuring about being given something by someone you've got to know. And although I've kind of got to know um, Dr Benito because I've emailed him and I've spoken to him on the phone once, I haven't really got to know him. There's still something in the back of your mind that says, hmm, something might not quite be right here. All Juliet can do is put her trust in a Spanish doctor she's never met. Quite a few people say, oh, are you brave? But no, not at all. Just desperate in a way.
After five weeks of drug treatment, Lucy Ralph furloughs packing up to travel to London. She has to have her IVF there, at the only hospital in the country that tests for the gene Lucy and Steve carry. It's a long journey, and Steve can't afford to take time off work to go with her. I, um, I'm just thinking about how long I'm going to be there, and I can't really arrange anything for definite. It's too expensive for Lucy to travel back and forward, so she'll stay with a friend near London while she has IVF. All right, hon. Love you. Bye-bye. Is that going to uh, and Joshua's house? No. Just me and you. <laughs> clothes. Clothes. Just take everything, I think. Just take my wardrobes. The reality of the situation is hitting home. We could fall at so many points here. Yeah. We might not produce eggs. We might overproduce eggs. The eggs might not fertilise. They might fertilise and then get tested for, for SMA and they might all have it. So the chances of getting to that next stage just feel against us. Ready. Hello? I'm coming. Um, well, I was leaving at four. Now I'm leaving at about five, so it's more likely to be six. <laughs> about be, what time do you go to bed? Before they leave, Penny and Lucy have to make a special visit because they'll be away from home for what would have been Bradley's sixth birthday. Oh, my boy. Put these flowers in here for him. When Bradley died, you always lose a part of yourself. And that part is gone. It's dead and buried with him. And you never get that back, ever. What the state are you, Brad? You need your grass cutting. Happy birthday, mate. Love you. It is the day of Lucy's egg collection, and Steve has travelled overnight by coach to meet her at the hospital in London. Lucy is now feeling the full effects of the drugs. Very sore, very swollen, very fat, <laughs> very uncomfortable. It needs to get out of there. I'm an egg, get me out of here. Like all IVF patients, Lucy is sedated for the egg collection because the process can be uncomfortable. Now, Lucy, if you can hear me, you will feel sharp scratch coming on the right-hand side. If you can keep nice and still, please. I'm going to give you a wee bit more sedation. So just keep very still for me. Two hours later, the couple leave hospital. The doctors will fertilise as many eggs as possible and grow them on in the lab before testing them and discarding any embryos with SMA. We can now start to analyse a single cell taken from an eight-cell embryo. That eight-cell embryo is three days after fertilisation. It is ten times smaller than your average full stop and look for specific genetic disorders. Not done very much in this country. There are a few clinics that have the facilities to do it. It requires a huge amount of technical expertise.
But if Lucy and Steve must prepare to throw away embryos, Juliet and Stan are still trying to create some. They're now in Spain, and while Juliet has been taking the drugs she was sent, she's not been checked by any medical staff. We're just trying to have a baby. It's thousands, millions of people do this every day, and they just do it, and they just manage to have a baby. That's all we're trying to do. OK, yes, the way we're going about doing it is a little bit unusual, having to go to Spain for egg transfer. But... Three days after they arrive, and weeks after starting to take the drugs, they finally meet the doctor. OK, Juliet. Yeah. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> OK, hi, good morning. How are you? Have a seat, please. Dr Benito sees the donor separately to prepare her for egg collection. Okay. Uh, the donor, she is uh, with the therapy. OK. OK. If she is ready for Wednesday, we are going to take the eggs, and I need you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. And we are going to work with the eggs and with your uh, sample. In the UK, the law allows only two embryos to be put back to try and avoid multiple births, but the rules can be different abroad. Here in Spain, we are able to use three embryos at the same time, because, as you know, in other countries, for example, uh, it's only uh, allowed two, two or one. OK. <laughs> Wonderful. OK, so let's uh, go and do the ultrasound, OK? okay? The time has come to find out if Juliet has been taking the drugs correctly. Oh, it's just nice to have a little lie down. This is the endometrium. Mm -hmm. It's a perfect endometrium. <laughs> it's ready to implant the embryos. Mm. <laughs> it's a, a huge relief that, yes, it's going, going well and that everything's on target, everything's on track. I suppose. Um, enough relief to make me want to collapse in a little huddle of tears, but... <laughs> oh, it's just a huge relief. Now they just have to hope that the donor, whom they will never meet, is also on track. In England, Lucy's staying with her friend Gail. I think you need to do whatever you can to your chances, although there's no scientific... She's heard that 11 of her 21 eggs have fertilised. But her embryos must keep developing if the crucial genetic biopsy is to be done, as husband Steve is only too aware. Steve's getting scared now. Is he? And it finally dawned on him last night that he's said, bless him, what if they phone and there's been no new development, no new growth on the eggs? Um, that's the end of it then, it's isn't the it? the end, yeah. So it's just waiting for the phone call now. I hate it's waiting for phone calls, yeah, I feel sick now. Do you? Yeah, I've got butterflies in my tummy. They won't come out. <laughs> Lucy has no idea if the hospital will be able to test any of the embryos, but she is desperate for news. Lucy Ralph Furlow was about to hear if her embryos are mature Hello? enough to be tested for the fatal condition that killed her first child. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Bye. How many? Ten. Ten have gone for biopsy, so we've only lost one, which is very good, because you normally lose quite a lot. So they won't call you tomorrow, you just go to hospital now? Mm. I was nervous today. God knows what I'm going to be like But it's exciting tomorrow. as well, isn't it? Are you not a bit excited? Scared. Sick. <laughs> Meanwhile, Juliet and Stan Stamper's two-week IVF holiday in Spain is almost over. 
but they've had to cancel their flight home because the anonymous egg donor wasn't ready. They know that Dr. Benito has now collected eggs from the donor and they're waiting to hear if any have been fertilized with Stan's sperm. So we're back to another kind of waiting day, waiting day, waiting day. And of course I'm kind of feeling every little twinge and creep with me, is it that, you know, I just have this worry about over, not quite nice to say this, but over ripening perhaps. But um, obviously we're not going to sit in the room here and wait for the phone to ring. We'll wait down by the pool because I said so. Until Dr. Benito calls, they've no idea if they have any embryos or when they should go to the clinic. Well, it's not going to make any difference what time we find out. The number of eggs will be the same whenever we find out. But so we might as well have a nice time while we're here. <laughs> To, like with Spain in general, to then try and hurry anything, it doesn't do you any good. When they've heard nothing by 10 that night, they're starting to wonder if things have gone wrong. Wow, tomorrow's the big day. Yeah. Uh, well, we think, angry. we hope. I'm sure at some point he'll phone up and tell us when. And if he hasn't phoned by midday, <laughs> I'll give him a ring and find out. Yeah. You didn't get his mobile? No, I didn't. In the end. <laughs> if things have gone wrong, their trip to Spain has been an expensive waste of time. It is the following morning before a call comes through. He rang this morning about nine o'clock. <laughs> Were you in the shower? So just. He said he wanted to see us at midday, mm -hmm. and there had been there were, well, there were five embryos yesterday, um, and we'd have to see today mm -hmm. how many there still were. As long as there's one, that's fine. Two would be good, one's fine. Relax as much as you can, OK? In fact, three embryos are good enough to be put in Juliet's womb. But in Britain, that would not be allowed. Look, in here you have your babies. So I am going to put the catheter inside. Don't move, please. I am going to take out the catheter. And now the embryologist is going to check the catheter to see if all of them are inside the uterus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, perfect. Very good. You have your embryos inside your uterus. Now you must to stay here for one hour. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. So let's go. Whatever will be, will be, as the song goes. You still can't help but pray and hope that the outcome will be a pregnancy, a baby, two babies maybe, three, possibly, but a baby is what we want. Five days after egg collection, Lucy's on her way back to London to find out if any of her embryos are healthy and suitable for implantation. First Great Western Link London Paddington. a bit busy. Lucy knows this is her only chance. The NHS is paying the £5,000 cost of this one treatment, money she couldn't possibly afford. Steve's travelled from Blackpool again to be with Lucy when they hear the results. They've no idea if the news will be good or bad as they meet embryologists. OK, so we were able to look at ten of your embryos and we're able to say that four of them are suitable for us to replace. It's always very good when we have excellent so number to choose. does that mean that out of the ten, six actually did have? Two were affected. 
one of them, some of them we couldn't get an actual definite result on and sometimes we don't get any signal at all which yeah. doesn't allow us to do any diagnosis on it. So unfortunately the numbers go down yeah. as you go through the process, as yeah. you probably find. At least there's some left. How are you feeling? You must be relieved. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. Overwhelmed. Yeah. Understanding, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. Do you have any questions for us? Yeah. Well, we're here to I will do the minute we leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Without PGD, any embryo the couple produce has a 25% chance of having SMA. With this technique, that goes down to just 5%, a risk worth taking. Yeah, I feel quite need a wee now. <laughs> we shouldn't remind you then. <laughs> <laughs> the embryos are coming. Loaded on the catheter. Okay. Okay. If you see that, do the white dot right there? Yes, that is a fluid with the embryos inside. Right. And it was very straightforward, nice and easy. <laughs> <laughs> Because Lucy is young and fertile, hopes are high for a positive pregnancy test in two weeks. At every stage we've been lucky to get 21 eggs and then to get so many fertilised and then for so many to be able to be biopsied and then to have so many, like, to be able to have two that they can implant, brilliant. And that they've grown and they're doing what they should be doing, so hopefully, fingers crossed, they should continue on to pregnancy. I'll let you know in two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Back in Norwich, Juliet Stampers facing a tough wait for the day when she can do a pregnancy test to see if any of the three embryos have taken. I know I can live my life without giving birth, but I don't want to. I have a yearning in me to just experience that. It's hard to define it. I don't know why I feel that. I don't know. All I know is, you know, there's times when I've heard that other people are pregnant who are close to me, friends, relatives, colleagues, and it, it's like, it's like someone's got hold of your heart, squished it up. Over the coming days, Juliet veers from hoping she's pregnant to believing she's not. I feel completely convinced that, that I'm pregnant and it's worked and... I don't know why, I can't put my finger on why it is, but I just feel this real conviction that, that I am. You know, I started to feel little tweaks and funny pains and... And every time I felt something, I felt a kind of a little bit afraid and, and a bit less hopeful. I just want to know. It just seems to be dragging. I mean, two weeks, OK, two weeks isn't a big deal. It's not a long time, but it's, it's, it seems like it's forever. It's just... It's just dragging. At last, the day arrives to do a pregnancy test. Two blue lines on the test stick will mean they are pregnant. She can't tell with the shadows. Oh, no, I can see something. Oh, dear. That's two. It's two. It's two. Yeah. Let's have one. Oh, yeah, the one. Two. <laughs> <laughs> we could have a very big phone bill. Oh, it is still two, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's not going away. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I can't quite believe it. 
positive and it's actually positive. So they've got to believe it really, haven't they? Mm -hmm. Oh, just stunned, happy, shocked, surprised. Mm. Yeah, I think it's sort of a little bit. Yeah, it's still a bit of something that makes you sort of not want to quite believe it yet. I want to see a bit more. A bit more evidence. evidence. <laughs> <laughs> when we have the baby, <laughs> I'll believe yeah, it then. I'll believe it then. So, oh. but. so well, we've reached the first hurdle, haven't we? Mm -hmm. So now it's the twelve-week hurdle. Lucy's back home after having her two embryos put back. Already stressed by the wait to see if she's pregnant, she's now being given notice by the landlord. Just such bad timing. Real, real bad timing. Um, he's selling the house, so we've got no option but to move. Um, but we haven't... We, well, we've struggled trying to find anywhere to move to. Okay. The last thing I need is to move to a new area where we don't know anyone, start Penny at a new school, go through all the traumas of explaining our history to everyone again, how to make new friends. On top of all of this, I just don't want it. Pat, pat, pat. Not yet, Mummy. Our house, it never, ever rains, it pours. Oh. Everything always has to happen at once. <laughs> We just don't know where we're heading at the moment. Juliet's joy after her positive pregnancy test has turned to anxiety as she approaches her first scan at five weeks pregnant. I've just kind of got this real worry that they'll do the scan and there'll be nothing there. It'll be empty. It'll be a blank screen. I don't know what to do then. It'd be very strange. That's, that's my worry, that's my fear. The following morning, Juliet leaves the school where she teaches to meet Stan for her scan. The moment of truth has arrived. OK, Juliet, we're just going to have a look now and see how things are going for you. OK. Juliet and Stan Stamper have come for a scan three weeks after their positive pregnancy test. Juliet is anxious to know whether all three embryos have survived. I think there's definitely one. There looks like another one I'm just trying to get a good picture of, though. Not very easy, because they're hiding away a little bit. I think there's three. <laughs> OK, and I have seen a pulsation on them. Each one of them. Okay. Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> right. Oh, my word. If you look on the screen, that's as close as we're going to get. You can see that there are definitely three sets. Yes. Okay. Yeah, These are going to be the. Life is going to change. <laughs> really change now. <laughs> are you all right? Yes. <laughs> Take your breath away a little. Okay. She said there were three. It was a sort of big shock, and it sort of, and I didn't really say very much, but it was just sort of, <laughs> just sort of working through all the sort of implications and everything else. Obviously, the the chances of going full term are almost nil with triplets, and the chances are I found that you'd go either to 33 or 36 weeks. So if you can get to 36 weeks, lungs are better developed. There's fewer chances of birth defects, but the, the earlier they're born, their chances of survival are much lower. Twelve days after she came back from London, it's the night before Lucy's pregnancy test. I'm scared and apprehensive. I don't really want to do the test now, in case it confirms that we aren't going to have another baby. Um, but the morning will tell. We will find out if it's worked or not. 
So see you again in the morning. The following morning, Lucy and Steve are up early to do the test. They have to wait five minutes to see if two blue lines appear. Does it say five minutes? The line appeared in the morning. Yeah, that's the sample in there. That says it's worked. Oh. We've got a negative result, so that's the end, the end of it. It's not worked for us. Weeks later, Lucy is still coming to terms with their failure. They want another baby, but there are a lot of things to be weighed up. It was stressful, emotionally, financially, physically. It was a stress on the marriage, stress on the relationship with Penny. We just don't want Penny to be an only child. She's desperate for a brother or sister, isn't she? Yeah, so... That's it. Now walk along. Sometimes I feel very selfish in thinking that we should want another when there's so many women out there that just can't have children. And we have had right. children. But the other side, I think, well, why am I so wrong in wanting a brother or sister for Penny, another child? Is that so wrong? the best bit. The only other option is we can have one naturally, but the inevitable will be it might have SMA again, so our options aren't open really until we know if we get funding or not. And that's quite frustrating to think that it's there, you, the possibility is just there, you can just reach out and grab it, but you can't because of the money. After a while, the NHS has to make choices, and that's not to put a value judgment on a baby. It's just a practical and pragmatic uh, approach that, you know, you have to balance between people who need transplants, people who want uh, IVF, it's all sorts of things. In Norwich, Juliet's now just over 10 weeks pregnant with triplets. But last night she had a bleed and she's come to the hospital fearing the worst. Hello. Hello. Let's have a little look and see what's going on. Did you get any sleep last night? Not a lot, no. But it was a kind of like, what I should have done is got up and read some of the books because the blood was a kind of a brownish blood rather than a reddish blood. And the, and the little books kept saying, oh no, if it's reddish blood, it's not so good, and if it's brownish blood, it's less, less bad. <laughs> There's certainly one little one with a heartbeat. I'm wriggling round. OK. And there's a little heart ticking with this one as well. Oh, not quite so easy to see. You just see a little heart ticking away there. And this sack here is empty. Can you see? That's... Yep. So you can see them both wriggling around nicely there. So it seems like it's been such a struggle to get, you know, the last few years to get to this far.
Juliet and Stan are adjusting to the idea of twins and not triplets. I see it almost as a silver lining to a cloud, where the cloud is having lost one, and OK, that is a loss. But it's making the chances for the other two so much better. And I know that in a physical way, you, um, it's been explained that you, you're, you reabsorb into your body a lot of the baby that's gone. Um, and in a way, I, I kind of imagine what's being reabsorbed going back into the other two. So the third baby, in a way, is still going to be part of them. It's nature's way, I suppose, of making sure the two reach full term healthily and successfully. So it's sad, but, but you have to be optimistic about it. You have, to, you have to look forward and see that, yes, it is still positive. Yeah, I mean, we've still got two healthy babies. It's mm. sort of, you can't be disappointed about that. Um. <laughs> Juliet's 20 week scan showed that her twins are doing well and are a boy and a girl. See limbs and everything properly formed. Yeah, you can. Um, Fingers and toes. That's really bizarre. And they were, they were leaping all over the place. <coughs> yeah, you just, I just couldn't believe how much they were leaping yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. Think yeah. Yeah. The babies are due at the end of May. All children are special, but they're going to be precious. <laughs> <laughs>